Okay, and what we're going to do, first of all, this uh, slot can be horizontal, vertical, diagonal, to stop the uh, issue with the bees coming up and not going in. And we have been putting one dark frame of comb right in the center of the hole. And then this year, I'm going to have mediums on either side of it. And then foundation beside that. That way, if, they, if we don't get to the swarm trap in time, they could build the burr comb on the mediums and we could care less because they're going to build it straight. It'll be drone comb, but we don't care at that point in time. We think based on a lot of experience, the more, the less obstructions you have in front of the entrance and have this slot, the more the chances are that things are going to be successful. I just talked to Tammy and her and Doug had some swarms that would come up and not go in, but they were there, if they'd be there for a few hours. They ran out and just took care of the bees before they moved on or started to build comb. So there is an issue there of, of swarms coming up in some cases. I'd say probably 10% of the time or 5% of the time. We, we set out 55 swarm traps and we caught 124 swarms. And we probably had around 10 swarms that would build comb right under the lip, yep. right here. And the first one I had was back in 2012 the kid I was working with, had uh, he was in the uh, National Guard. We set the trap and, and he left for two weeks. He came back and, he, and, the, and the girl said, five or six beautiful leaves this long underneath the swarm trap because we had, we had uh, strapped it to the tree. So it was unobstructed underneath. And when we walked up to it, I thought, holy crap, how big is that swarm? <laughs> no, 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 no. They had five or six combs that they were on. And they've been there for at least 10 days. So we think that's a slot. Because most of the trees we have seen this summer have slots. But there's a lot of squirrel holes too. And we see that also. And we've had good success with the hole. But we're trying to get rid of any problems with comb so you have to do a cutout to to get rid of it because some of us we're busy and we forget or we just don't have time to go out there to check our swarm traps every couple of days yeah. but so we're going to do that and now this is a really a, a swarm trap that my Amish kid uh, built for me this is the bottom then we just put another five frame nuke and top so that's the 10 gallons because According to Seeley's statistics, they're looking for a 10-gallon uh, cavity. Yeah. So we put another uh, five-frame nuke super on top, strap it, then now it's this high. So now you can strap it right to the tree, and it works. Now, we've used eight frames, we've used 10 frames, we've gone down to, on a chair two feet off the ground, we've gone up 25 feet on a deer stand. It all works. but. My guy that does most of the swarm traps for me, he's a fireman, he's strong as an ox. He's 35 years old. Do you think I'm going to climb up a swarm a deer stand? No way. But he does. And we have caught a lot of swarms 25, 28 feet in the air. But most of them are about five. We use plastic barrels, and they work well too. So I would say to everybody, five feet, because if you forget and the swarm moves in, 10 days later, You've got 50 pounds sitting here. If you have, you know, a good swarm and good uh, nutritional food coming in, they're going to just go to the heart's content. So make it easy as possible for us. We've learned a lot. Now, since we caught 124 swarms, and we are, these are all basically true feral stock. They're out in the wilderness. They're not somebody else's problems. Of the 124 swarms, I'd say probably 50 to 60 percent of the queens we've lost. But we didn't know what we didn't know. But we still have probably 40, 45 at least swarms that are very strong right now. We've checked them. Then we're going to do the. We have them in areas that have chewing behavior. We know that ahead of time because we've done cutouts in these areas. And we've done cutouts, and some of them are chewing like 53% of their drop mice, and we're impressed with that. And it has nothing to do with feral, with uh, produced stock. 
Bees are evolving out there in God's country. If they're left alone, good nutrition, and no packaged bees to goof up the gene pool, we've got feral stock out there that are evolving on their own. So, and we found it, Dorothy's found it in Kentucky, <coughs> we've found it in Illinois and Indiana, and I've got seven uh, counties in Ohio that we've checked, uh, not just on the swarms, but cutouts, things like that, that people have done. And we know where, they're, where the original colony was at, and some of them have been there for three to five years without, and, and survive. And we know they're not a, another swarm moving in, you know, they die in another swarm. No, they're there. I'm from western Pennsylvania, and I have friends that have a garage. They have a feral colony there that's been there for seven years, and I've trained them every spring. Watch that day by day. It never dies out and a new swarm moves in. And those bees are nice colored bees. There's an area there in Pennsylvania where I was born and raised that has feral stock. You talk to the beekeepers. There's some people out there have no idea what beekeeping is. They just notice that, that they get a hanging swarm, dump it in a box. They could care less what the bees do. They put another super, uh, super, uh, super on top for cut comb honey. And the bees never die, and they don't treat them. To them, that's beekeeping, even though they don't know what they're doing. But the bees survive. So you know very well that... They're, art, they're chewing. Yeah. They, they just don't know. But they're having fun. 